Chapter 3, in which a witch accidentally enmagics an infant. At the center of the forest was a small swamp, bubbly, sulfury, and noxious, fed and warmed by an underground, restlessly sleeping volcano, and covered with a slick of slime whose color ranged from poison green to lightning blue to blood red, depending on the time of year. On this day, so close to the day of sacrifice in the protectorate, or star child day everywhere else, the green was just beginning to inch its way toward blue. At the edge of the swamp, standing right on the fringe of flowering reeds growing out of the muck, a very old woman leaned on a gnarled staff. She was short and squat and a bit bulbous about the belly. Her crinkly gray hair had been pulled back into a thick braided knot, with leaves and flowers growing out of the thin gaps between the twisted plates. Her face, despite its cloud of annoyance, maintained a brightness in those aged eyes and a hint of a smile in that flat, wide mouth. From certain angles, she looked a bit like a large, good-tempered toad. Her name was Zan, and she was the witch. Do you think you can hide from me, you ridiculous monster? She bellowed in the, at the swamp. It isn't as though I don't know where you are. Resurface this minute and apologize. She pressed her expression into something closely resembling a scowl, or I will make you. Though she had no real power over the monster himself, he was far too old. She certainly had the power to make the, that swamp cough him up as if he were nothing more than a glob of phlegm in the back of the throat. She could do it with just a flick of her left hand and a jiggle of her right knee. She attempted to scowl again. I mean it, she hollered. The thick water bubbled and swirled, and the large head of the swamp monster slurped out of the bluish green. He blinked one wide eye and then the other before rolling both toward the sky. Don't you roll your eyes at me, young man, the old woman huffed. Which, the monster murmured, his voice still half submerged in the thick waters of the swamp. I am as many centuries I am many centuries older than you. His wide lips blew a bubble in the algae slick. Millennia, really, he thought, but who's counting? I don't believe I like your tone. Zan puckered her wrinkled lips into a tight rosette in the middle of her face. The monster cleared his throat. As the poet famously said, dear lady, I don't give a rat's. Glurk, the witch shouted, aghast. Language. Apologies, Glurk said mildly, though he really didn't mean it. He eased both sets of arms onto the muck at the shore, pressing each seven-fingered hand into the shine of the mud. With a grunt, he heaved himself onto the grass. This used to be easier, he thought, though for the life of him he couldn't remember when. Firion is over there by the vents, crying his eyes out, poor thing, Zan fumed. Glurk sighed deeply. Zan thrust her staff onto the ground, sending a spray of sparks from the tip, surprising them both. She glared at the swamp monster. And you are just being mean. She shook her head. He's only a baby, after all. My dear Zan... Glurk said, feeling a rumble deep in his chest, which he hoped sounded imposing and dramatic, and not like someone he was simply like someone who was simply coming down with a cold. He is also older than you, and it is high time. Oh, you know what I mean. And anyway, I promised his mother for five hundred years, give or take a decade or two, that dragonline has persisted in these delusions, fed and perpetuated by you, my dear. How is this helping him? He is not a simply enormous dragon. At this point, there is no indication that he ever will be. There is no shame at all in being a perfectly tiny dragon. Size isn't everything, you know. His is an ancient and honorable species filled with some of the greatest thinkers of the Seven Ages. He has much to be proud of. His mother was very clear, Zan began, but the monster interrupted her. In any case, the time is long past that he know his heritage and his place in the world. I've gone, gone along with this fiction for far longer than I should have. But now, Glurk pressed his forearms to the ground and eased his massive bottom under the curve of his spine, letting his heavy, tall cur curl around the whole of him like a great, glistening snail's shell. He let the paunch of his belly sag over his folded legs. I don't know, my dear. Something has shifted. A cloud passed over his damp face, but Zan shook her head. Here we go again, she scoffed. As the poet says, O oh earth chain O oh ever earth changed. Hang on, hang the poet, go apologize. Do it right now. He looks up to you. Zan glanced at the sky. 
I must fly, my dear. I'm already late. Please, I am counting on you. Glurk lumbered toward the witch, who laid her hand on his great cheek. Though he was able to walk upright, he often preferred to move on all sixes, or all sevens, with the use of his tail as an occasional limb, or all fives if he happened to be using one of his hands to pluck a particularly fragrant flower and bring it to his nose, or to collect rocks, or to play a haunting tune on a hand-carved flute. He pressed his massive forehead to Zan's tiny brow. Please be careful, he said, his voice thick. I have been beset of late by troubling dreams. I worry about you when you are gone. Zan raised her eyebrows, and Glurk leaned his face away with a low grumble. Fine, he said. I will perpetuate the fiction for our friend Therian. The path to truth is in the dreaming heart, the poet tells us. That's the spirit, Zan said. She clucked her tongue and blew the monster a kiss, and she vaulted up and forward on her staff's fulcrum, sprinting away into the green. Despite the odd beliefs of the people of the Protectorate, the forest was not cursed at all, nor was it magical in any way, but it was dangerous. The volcano beneath the forest, low sl sloped and impossibly wide, was a tricky thing. It grumbled as it slept while heating geysers till they burst and restlessly worrying at fissures until they grew so deep that no one could find the bottom. It boiled streams and cooked mud and sent waterfalls disappearing into deep pits, only to reappear miles away. There were vents that spewed foul odors and vents that spewed ash and vents that seemed to spew nothing at all until a person's lips and fingernails turned blue from bad air and the whole world started to spin. The only truly safe passage across the forest for an ordinary person was the road, which was situated on a naturally raised seam of rock that had smoothed over, the, over time. The road didn't alter or shift, it never grumbled. Unfortunately, it was owned and operated by a gang of thugs and bullies from the Protectorate. Zan never took the road. She couldn't abide thugs or bullies. And anyway, they, changed, they charged too much. Or they did last time she checked. It had been years since she had gone near it, many centuries now. She made her own way instead, using a combination of magic and know-how and common sense. Her treks across the forest weren't easy, by any means, but they were necessary. A child was waiting for her, just outside the Protectorate, a child whose very life depended on her arrival, and she needed to get there in time. For as long as Zan could remember, every year at about the same time, a mother from the Protectorate left her baby in the forest, presumably to die. Zan had no idea why, nor did she judge, but she wasn't going to let the poor little thing perish, either. And so, every year, she traveled to that circle of sycamores and gathered the abandoned infant in her arms, carrying the child to the other side of the forest, to one of the free cities on the other side of the road. These were happy places, and they loved ch children. At the curve of the trail, the walls of the protectorate came into view. Zan's quick steps slowed to applaud. The protectorate itself was a dismal place. Bad air, bad water, sorrow settling over the roofs of its houses like a cloud. She felt a yoke of sadness settle onto her own bones. Just get the baby and go, Zan reminded herself, as she did every year. Over time, Zan had started making certain preparations. A blanket woven of the softest lamb's wool to wrap the child and keep it warm. A stack of cloths to freshen a wet bottom. A bottle or two of goat's milk to fill an empty tummy. When the goat's milk ran out, as it invariably did, the trek was long and milk is heavy. Zan did what any sensible witch would do. Once it was dark enough to see the stars, she reached up one hand and gathered starlight in her fingers like the silken threads of spider's webs and fed it to the child. Starlight, as every witch knows, is a marvelous food for, for a growing infant. Starlight collection takes a certain knack and talent, magic for starters. But children eat it with gusto. They grow fat and sated and shining. It didn't take long for the free cities to treat the yearly arrival of the witch as something of a holiday. The children she brought with her, their skin and eyes bright with starlight, were seen as a blessing. Zan took her time selecting the proper family for each child, making sure their characters and inclinations and senses of humor were a good match for the little, for the little life that she had cared for over the course of such a long journey. And the star children, as they were called, grew from happy infants to kind adolescents to gracious adults. They were accomplished, generous of spirit, and successful. When they died of old age, they died rich. When Zan arrived at the grove, there was no baby to be seen, but it was still early, and she was tired. She went to one of the 